I'm here as my capacity as a member of the Enterprise Trade and Investment Committee. It's my first session in the Assembly. I've com completed almost five years now, so we're looking forward to get back out on the doorsteps in the forthcoming election and see how competitive we are in the, the political world out there. The theme of the, uh, the sessions is improving Northern Ireland's competitiveness. I think it's a real challenge when you consider the, the recent news there's been in relation in especially to manufacturing in Northern Ireland. The, today's presentations respectfully address competing in a global economy, developing our skills base and marketing of local food and drink. And this being the year of food and drink, it should be very interesting to see how really competitive we are in relation to that and to see uh, how we measure up in relation to quality. So that should be an interesting session. These topics are timely. They dovetail well with the work of the committee and of the executive. The ultimate aim of the executive's economy strategy is to improve the executive's economy is to improve the economic competitiveness of Northern Ireland. It seeks to build an economy that by 2030 will be characterised by a sustainable and growing private sector where a greater number of firms compete in global markets and there is growing employment and prosperity for all. It aims to do this by a number of objectives, stimulating R&D and innovation, something that the committee has looked at consistently over the past years. Improving our skills base, we're to hear about that later on. Enhancing our global competitiveness, helping business to grow and developing or economic infrastructure. In 2015, the Committee for Enterprise Trade and Investment undertook an inquiry into growth and job creation in a reduced tax environment, something that we're looking forward to. The purpose of the inquiry was to understand how Northern Ireland might enhance its economic competitiveness in order to maximise the impact of devolving cooperation tax powers. During this inquiry, the committee heard evidence from a, a range of groups on how we might achieve this. The evidence presented to us suggested that much of the positive and constructive work undertaken by the executive departments, arms length bodies and local government, such as the economic strategy, the investment strategy and the regional development strategy, as well as the investment by Dale, Department of Employment and Learning, that much of the positive and constructive work is in areas of skills development. The committee, however, also was told that departments needed to take a more integrated approach to economic development. In its inquiry report, the committee recommended that the executive articulate and implement a rolling 20-year shared vision and strategy for economic development. The committee stated that such a strategy should seek to integrate a full range of policy areas, education, skills and infrastructure, as well as in the support government provides to business and our innovative cap capacities. All that is needed to fully exploit the opportunity that devolution of cooperation tax offers and to create an economy for the benefit of everyone in Northern Ireland. Today's presentations from Queen's University Belfast and the Ulster University explore a number of these issues. First, we will hear from Professor Rob Giles from Queen's, who will comment on how the Northern Ireland economy can become more competitive in the 21st century global economy. His presentation provides insights into the global economy and the current economic theory. It examines how Northern Ireland might attract investment and the utility of lowering cooperation tax. Later, Mr. Mark McGill will outline findings from work undertaken by the Ulster University Economic <coughs> Policy Centre on its Northern Ireland skills barometer, something that, again, the committee have been very interested in within recent days. This research identifies skills supply gaps and areas of oversupply and also sets out how Northern Ireland might address these gaps and how we might better balance skills, provision and economic needs. 
Finally, a timely presentation as we embark on the Northern Ireland Year of Food and Drink. Ms Rachel Malcolmson from the Ulster University. She will outline the findings of her research and the role food packaging plays in, in, in determining customer perceptions of food quality and how it influences their purchasing decisions. All very interesting subjects. I um, trust you will enjoy your, your seminar and I will now hand over to Professor Rob Giles. Thank you all very much. I hope you enjoy your session here at Stormont Buildings. Thank you. I, um, I am not Northern Irish, as you can hear. Um, I'm originally from the Netherlands and I have uh, worked for 18 years in the United States before coming to Queens as a professor of economics. And I will talk about the latest insights from a theoretical point of view, economic theoretical point of view about the global economy and why we are in the kind of mess that we are. And although we know why we are there, it doesn't mean that we have answers. There are no easy solutions to get out of this problem as, um, as I will try to explain. So, um, we are actually in a mess much longer than uh, the numbers have shown in the past. Everybody thought that the 90s was great and all that. But what we call secular stagnation, the, the underlying trend in productivity, has been bad for already 40 years. So, I have a little graph here that shows that. This is a very long-term graph, essentially since the Second World War. And then you see that there's very significant uh, growth uh, in the factor productivity uh, up to the 70s, and then we get the big stagflation of the 1970s, and then it diminishes quite rapidly, and since 2008, it has become even much worse than it was between the 1970s and uh, 2008. So, um, what we are looking at is, in my opinion, um, a, something that resembles the Long Depression, not the Great Depression, but the Long Depression uh, that was uh, occurred between the 1870s and the uh, 1890s. And that was a period of 25 years of stagnation and recessions and crisis. And the starting point of that is the, what is called the Great Panic of 1873 which looks very much like what we had in 2008, a financial crisis that looked exactly the same. It's a fallacy to think that the world is, uh, was heading towards something like the Great Depression uh, from the 1930s. It is really fundamentally different. And um, I would like to talk a little bit about um, what is causing this secular stagnation, as we call it today, which is essentially what was very much the same as the Long Depression of the 19th century, and how we can uh, link it to a theory of wealth creation. So markets do not create wealth. It just allocates wealth. What is creating wealth is a social division of labor, and nobody talks about the social division of labor. And um, we have now devised theories that understand much better the working of the social division of labor. And those are network-based theories. They're not market-based theories. And so I am talking about the latest insights from the theories to explain what goes around us. And I will, first of all, talk about the global economy, therefore. And then I will try to link it back to the Northern Irish economy, where it stands in the global economy, and what are the general lessons that can be applied also to the Northern Irish economy? And how can we leap ahead, so to say, uh, through this crisis? Uh, and hopefully it will, will also settle and, and become better again at some point, although it's not clear yet uh, how that is going to happen. Um, all right, so I would like to, first of all, set out how wealth is created. Wealth is created through the interplay of three fundamental things. This is, first of all, if you repeat to do things, is already pointed out by Adam Smith. So Adam Smith, I will use a, uh, refer to a lot in this talk. 
he said that when you repeat a task, you come better at it. And this is a fundamental human property. And throughout our human existence, we have created wealth through learning to do things better. And those are called increasing returns to specialization. And we bring that together in a social division of labor. So we divide the tasks among us. All of us are highly productive because we become experts, specialists on a certain number of tasks. And we bind that together in a well-organized structure in which we link the specialized individuals. And we usually call them markets, how we link them, but they're not really markets, they are networks. And then trade happens to uh, uh, allocate the wealth that is created, essentially. Um, however, what has been neglected in economics for a long time and what is of crucial importance is governance. The governance of the social division of labor. There are institutions that guide the social division of labor. And when I say governance, it's very easily, easy to jump to government. And so government has always had a crucial role in the creation of wealth. It has always had a crucial role why the social division of, of labor was working or why it was not working. And in market theory, it is as if the government is completely unimportant and everything runs by itself. And that has been infecting our mindset, in my opinion, in the 20th century in particular, about how the economy is working. And so I am here to promote the idea that institutions are crucial and that secular stagnation is a consequence of an institutional crisis. It is our institutions are not working properly and not working effectively to make this social division of labor work for us. And that uh, is, is, so to say, the, the thesis of the theory uh, that I try to, to promote here. So, um, in the social division of labor, there are two sources of wealth. The first one we know very well, because that is also the story from standard market economics, that is technological development. If we invest in technology, and production te technology becomes better, we produce more, we get higher returns to, uh, to, to invest it, effort and time, and so we grow, and we get larger wealth. However, there is a very important second source of um, wealth uh, growth uh, that has been neglected and that comes to the fore when you really think about the social division of labor and that is the so-called deepening of the social division of labor and that is organizational, it is not technological. So it is the organization of the social division of labor that changes and that leads to the so-called deepening. So the change, the change in the social division of labor lengthen. So you get longer chains with more specializations, with deeper specializations, tapping into those in increasing returns to specialization, so to say. So we create wealth by reorganizing ourselves. Now, these reorganizations, of course, are very cumbersome and very expensive in some sense and very fragile and very difficult. But we are constantly doing that. And so the crisis of 2008 was caused by the failure of Smithian development in the financial sector of the economy. So we, get, we had in the 1990s and the early 2000s major Smithian development, as I would like to call it, from referring back to Adam Smith, in the financial sector of the economy. And they created brand new products, they created brand new uh, professions, they reorganized themselves fundamentally. They created a lot of institutions to support these changes. We got rating agencies, we got uh, government uh, support, uh, that was different from, from what was in the past, uh, that supported these changes, and um, it failed. 
And it shows that wealth creation is a very difficult and fragile process, and it can fail. And when it fails, there are devastating consequences to it. Um, so what I would like to, uh, to promote here is that the idea that um, we have at the moment a crisis of institutions, because the institutions have to hold together the social division of labor, and when the social division of labor is reorganizing, changing, then these institutions are there to support that and to make these things better. I also talk about things here that are very hard to measure, of course. I, I don't show you graphs, because there is nothing to show in graphs, because when I talk about institutions, we talk about very uh, basic things like rules of how we do things, laws. Uh, we talk about um, uh, agreements, uh, very fragile things in some sense, also things that we cannot measure in a number. And so, that is uh, a real big problem of this, uh, this whole uh, theory, that we cannot quantify it so easily. However, what is central to the theory is that if you want to have real economic growth and, and wealth creation, you have to recognize the central role of entrepreneurship. And entrepreneurship is not here somebody who starts to be self-employed and starts to drive a taxi, it is somebody who contributes to this deepening, to this Smithian development in the social division of labor. So th those are people that really create new things and reorganize the economy. And we have some well-known examples from the past, of course, uh, Steve Jobs and Apple is one of them. Uh, he changed the big, uh, boom that Apple went through started with the iPod and the, and the creation of iTunes, he changed essentially in a very fundamental way the music industry and the entertainment industry. And he created brand new products to do that, including the iPod, also a service, right? iTunes service. He had to rely on uh, the information technology to be there to have the internet and, and have direct access to, to his services. And he created in that way a brand new part of the social division of labor in some sense. Yeah. And he also made obsolete other parts of the social division of labor, right? The, the, the music industry fundamentally changed because of this creation. Yeah. And it fundamentally changed how wealth was allocated as well. Right, so we talk about creating new products, creating new specializations, creating uh, new trade networks, new structures. And competition that is related to this in networks is different from competition as we understand it in markets. It is all about controlling networks. And again, I go back to Apple as the great example here. Apple controls the networks in which it operates. Every part of that network is controlled. Uh, other big success stories of our 21st century eco uh, economy, like Walmart, Tesco, uh, Google, they are all in the business of controlling the networks in which they operate. And I'm not saying markets here. I'm saying networks because it is about writing specific contracts that capture these, uh, these trade uh, flows, right? So it is about uh, controlling your suppliers and it is about controlling your customers. And that is what this um, um, uh, uh, e economy is about at the moment. Yeah? And this also hampers, therefore, through innovation, and it hampers this deepening of the social division of labor. And so our practices, which are the institutions, right? I, I use the word institution here as a behavioral rule, for example. How you do business, the rule of how you do business, 
hampers by itself, hampers the real development of this social division of labor and therefore hampers growth. Right? And what we need is to innovate the institutions in the way that we do business. And like I said, I believe that government has a very important role to play here. Okay, so um, going to the Northern Irish economy. Right, so I, I see the Northern Irish economy as very marginal. Of course, it is a relatively underdeveloped part of, of the European uh, uh, economies. And um, there is, of course, much lower growth here than elsewhere. Um, and at the moment, the policies of the governments the UK government and the Northern Irish government, which is also very much determined by the UK government, of course, is not helping us at all at the moment, of course. And that means uh, if you really want to grow the economy, you have to tap into that Smithian development, as I call it. Right? Uh, technological development is secondary in some sense. What we need is organizational development institutional development. We need to jump on the trends for the future, so to say. Right? And we have, um, if I read a little bit about what, what the local government has invested in, um, it has to be, it has to be uh, said that it was insufficient investment into this really new kind of uh, development that is required to get this economy really going. So, it comes to education in some sense. And that links with the other speakers that we have here. Um, we need to invest big time in education. So, when I compare my American students that I taught in the United States with my Northern Irish students that I teach here, there is really a day and night difference. Right? The American dream, as it is called, is really instilled in them, and they really think that their lives are guided by them themselves. They are there to make it happen and to go ahead in the world and to work hard to accomplish things. I miss that completely here. Right? Here everybody thinks that you are there to teach them. Right? Instead of saying, oh, it's my own responsibility, I'm jumping in, and I work hard. And I, I had American students that uh, very diligently worked on their coursework, but also had a lot of activities outside uh, the curriculum, so to say, with charities, political organizations, churches, whatever you have, to participate in society and to network and to build a future. And these people, um, they really believe that they could change the world. And so no wonder that there is Silicon Valley in uh, California and not here in Northern Ireland, in some sense. At least that is how I feel. Um, because I miss that in, in the students that I teach. To give you a startling uh, fact, only about half of the students actually show up for lectures at the moment. There is a really a lack of participation, a lack of, um, a, a lack of a spirit of entrepreneurship in some sense, because that goes to the spirit that I want to talk about. What we need to do is somehow create a spirit of entrepreneurship, that you have to take control of your life and that you want to contribute and that you want to build. And that is the bed and brother uh, that drives this Smithian development, as I call it. Yeah. So we need to change essentially education. We need to instill them with a goal, with a desire to do something. And that goes from very young already, in my opinion. And what I see is only kids that want to do exams and are really not interested at all very much what they want to, what, what is presented to them as knowledge, so to say, a knowledge that they can use to 
to uh, help society, to create something new in society. Yeah. So, all of education needs to be rethought in some sense. It, it needs to uh, become less customer-oriented as it is now. It should be more about empowering people. Right? And the, the tone of what I see at Queen's, for example, is very different from that. Of course, there's also then the role of government itself uh, to invest in cutting-edge technologies, to give startups uh, uh, a chance, and to invest in new things. Right? In some sense, what, what, what is in the news is declining old industry. Bombardier um, is in some sense not the future. It is the past, and we try to maintain the past. Um, the UK in general is moving very rapidly to a service economy. If you look at the numbers, the growth in manufacturing is negative. The, yeah, it is, so there, there is a shrinking manufacturing sector and a booming service sector. And in some sense, uh, we need to, to, to rethink what we want, what, what, what will... The, future be at the moment it is London and the service economy there that is the UK at the moment and that is growing and that is why the UK in general is growing the rest is not growing very much yeah. so um, we need to also invest besides in services we need to invest into new technology into new things green energy information technologies those kind of things. 